Aloha! What's up, everyone? I'm Jay Dreamers, and welcome to Truth and Movie Mondays. So, every Monday, we like to break down uh, movies that I like, and I share them with you. I see a lot of esoteric symbolism and occult symbolism in the movies, stuff that reflects back to me, my life, and uh, the status of the world that we're in today, and it gives me little breadcrumbs of little nuggets of truth from times we may have forgotten in the ancient past, and things we may have forgotten that we could look forward to. So, what's up to everybody in the chat? Good to see you all. Um, yes, I did shave a bit, so I might look a little different. Um, but yeah, this 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 movie right here is on Netflix. So if you want to check it out and you have Netflix, uh, you can definitely watch it anytime. It's a great uh, Halloween movie. It's a great family scary movie if you want to watch it. You know, with your younger ones. And it's amazing. So I want to jump right into this. It's This whole movie kind of has like a Hansel and Gretel feel to it. So let's go ahead and start things off. I'm going to start doing a little screen sharing here. And we're going to jump right into this movie because I have a lot of things to point out in this movie. All right, sweet. So the first thing we start off uh, with the movie zooming into this building. Now, you may have seen a few different cartoons or various movies where... The theme is like a house or a building is the bad guy. Like the building is the monster. It always is trying to like seek out people to eat or to trap inside of it or something along those lines. Usually it's children. And I think that um, there's a good reason for that. We'll, we'll touch on that here in just a bit. Um, but sometimes it's also adults. The reason that they have the building looking to to try to kidnap like people and 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 trap them inside of the building is because the building quite often represents our world. Our world is re often represented on a smaller scale in the movies, wrapped up in a put a they put a little bow on it and they give it right back to us and say, "Here's your story. Here's your world. Here's everything you've forgotten about yourself." Essentially. So as you can see right smack in the middle of these lights here, is a light, a lighted room that's kind of reddish in color. So we go inside of that one. For some reason, it's not red on the inside when we zoom into it here. Um, but the red color, you'll see that throughout this movie and many other movies too, tends to let you know as the watcher that when you see a room go red or a building go red or the sky go red, that's letting you know, hey, you can expect some danger. You can expect some magic up ahead. And the archetype for that is our sky going red from blue to red. The sky changes colors after the polarity shift. And when that happens, all sorts of what we would refer to as and only consider magic enters into our world once more, which allows for our old memories to come flooding back rather quickly as we watch our world change. Now we go into the apartment and this is where this little boy named Alex lives. Um, Alex, it looks like they're <laughs> looks like they're decorating for Halloween, but actually this is a birthday party. This little kid Alex just loves horror stuff. He's into scary things, and he's just he's really into it. Whether it be Freddy Krueger or Jason Voorhees or anything, he's he's totally into all this like creepy, weird kind of stuff. And and that's been his thing. He writes uh, scary stories, and he's proud of it. He's uh, he's loved it for a long time. So his parents knew this. They decorated the entire house uh, as sort of a Halloween theme for his birthday. Interestingly enough. And then the movie starts off getting right into the action. The parents are saying that they're really worried about their son, Alex. Something's wrong with him. And the parents say, he said he'll never strut, he'll never write another story ever again. And you can see he looks upset there. He starts ripping down all the horror stuff that he has up in his room. He's got the Wolfman. He's got Godzilla. He's like, this is lame. This is stupid. He starts trying to just tear apart all the stuff that he's taken so long to build up, all the things that he's proud of, all of his little trophies, all the stuff that he decorates that represents him. And I don't know if, I mean, this is what I do in my house. I tend to decorate things that represent my interests, things that represent me or a part of me, right? So he's trying to rip himself apart by ripping this room apart. 
Then he knocks down a piece of glass. The glass shatters. That's also another clue that you're about to enter into something magical is because the glass shatters in the movie. It can be any kind of glass, but usually the second the glass shatters, there you're gonna. it's the same kind of concept, right? Because the dome of our world or the sky, one day, according to myths and legends of ancient times past across time and across cultures, indicate that the sky will fall, indicate that the sky will break somehow. Which is really interesting because there's another movie coming up right around the corner called Moonfall. And we're going to do that one too. Anyhow, so the glass shatters. The kid picks up his journal where he writes all of his most precious stories. Look at the cover of this book. That is what some people refer to as uh, the spaghetti monster. Um, Sometimes it's referred to... Where's my notes? (laughs) Well, a lot of times it's called the spaghetti monster, but uh, essentially this is the plasma up in the sky, right? The hole opens up in the sky, Medusa's head, whatever you want to call it, and all that plasma streaks into our world, and it's seen as the ultimate and quintessential um, villain in the story of our esoteric history. And it's really interesting because he writes it all in this. That is what makes it possible for us to re-experience a magical, mystical, mystifying, amazing terrifying to some um and beautiful new world it's a new it's a new era a new epic a new way of life because our world suddenly and drastically changes from time to time so he leaves his room as you can see here he's also a fan of the lost boys pretty much this kid is me (laughs) like i mean maybe that's why i like this movie so much this kid is pretty much me I love the Lost Boys. His whole see how his uh, his walls are red, right? Plasma apocalypse red. That means that he lives in the mystical realm, right? His energy resonates with the things that are extraordinary, the things that are not ordinary, which is actually what this movie is about. So this kid's really upset. That movie doesn't tell us why. He takes he takes apart his room. He grabs his notebook full of his most precious scary stories. He says goodbye to his Lost Boys poster vampires this kid's into everything vampires werewolves aliens um scary things you name it so (laughs) that's right up my alley so the parents continue talking they say but maybe we let his obsession with horror get out of hand hmm okay so some it's he's upset and it's got something to do with his own obsession with horror and they say man or the man says i guess i can see how they could consider it consider it a little weird so wait a minute what what Wait a minute. This kid's upset. He's taken off. He's got a sweet birthday set up in his house. He's not having a good time. And his parents are back there talking trash about how he's weird. That's not cool. I could see why he might be upset, right? Um, And I can relate to that, as I'm sure many of you can too. And you're going to relate to this kid a little more as we get into his story and why he's so upset. So the dad says, maybe it would be easier if he was just more, you know, I don't know, normal. Really? If you're a parent and you're just disappointed that your children are not normal like the other children are and you just pump them full of Ritalin or you just keep them busy on their tablet or their video games all the time or they're just glued to the screen. I mean, come on. Who wants that, right? Who wants to be normal like that? I don't want that. So the kid looks back. He's sad. He's leaving. He's basically running away from home. He takes off. The mom's looking for him. And they're dressed as skeletons, which to me is interesting and symbolic because they're basically dead if they think that their kid isn't special or less special because he's not normal, right? So she says Alex. So the kid's name is Alex. We'll look at that here in just a sec. Alex is short for Alexander. It's kind of hard to see right here. But Alexander comes from Greek Alexander Andros. Um, Alex essentially means to defend Ander or Andros means men or human, humanity. But Alex and the various offshoots of Alex, like Alice, right, Um, basically means somebody who is a guard, somebody who is a ward, somebody who is a protector, somebody that sees the best interest of humanity, essentially. And that's what this kid represents. Now, does that mean that those people have to be perfect? Do our heroes always have the greatest stories? No, they have often the most tragic stories. But those tragic stories are the roads that they walk in order to become heroes, right? So you're seeing a hero in the making, essentially. Kid gets in the elevator, hits the basement button. He's down, man. So he wants to go down, right? He wants to go all the way down to the basement. 
uh, which is represented by the letter B. So the elevator doors open and there is a conduit or a hallway. He looks through it and the elevator comes to a stop, but he's on the wrong floor. It stopped on the fourth floor and it won't go anywhere. So he has no choice but to get out, right? He starts walking and through this dark hallway, he hears the Lost Boys actually playing on a television, right? And they're playing a scene from the Lost Boys. You can see there's light coming from this room over here, giving a red line on the wall right there. That room is completely red, as I'll show you right here. The television showing it in red and everything. So he's, he's got the Lost Boys, one of his favorite shows. So now he's enticed to come in. He's enticed to enter in. He's being trapped, essentially. This is how the house gets him, right? So he steps up, he starts getting lost in the Lost Boys, um, which is really interesting because at the moment, he's sort of a Lost Boy, right? He doesn't like his own identity. Uh, so he's standing there in the hallway. He tries to pass it up, but this like spell goes over him. He, he goes into this sort of trance and then he opens his eyes and his eyes start looking a little lighter, almost like he's plasma possessed or something, right? He walks back over to the red room. Anytime that you see the red room, that's always symbolic of, Hey, you're about to enter into the apocalyptic world. Okay. The world where every, the world as you knew it, the world the way you once lived it is going to be fantasy in the future, okay? Like today's modern world will literally be some crazy story nobody's going to believe after, uh, you know, in the post-apocalyptic world, right? People will slowly start forgetting the time of the gods, the time of all of this wonderful luxuries that we have today, and they'll tell the, our stories. So think about that. You're working on your own story right now for a future generation. So he's hypnotized, standing there, zoned out in this red room, watching his favorite show. And then they, they zoom in on this piece of pie, right? He's enticed by this piece of pie. Somebody left out a little, a little snack for him, one of his favorite treats. It's pumpkin. Something about pumpkins, too. But pumpkin pie. Um, and you might just not even take a second guess at this. People might just be like, oh, that's weird. Why they put the pie? Why is it pumpkin, etc.? But also, if you look at... If you kind of blur your eyes a little bit and look at this image, they're actually showing you subliminal messages or a subliminal message. This is the all seeing eye. This is the eye itself, right? This is the eye in the sky that opens up right here. Let me see if uh, I can highlight it. Okay. So it goes around. This is the outer circle, just like we've talked about before. This is the inner circle and <laughs> excuse me, Woo! excuse me. Um, uh, this is the hole or the two holes that open up in our atmosphere or in our sky, in the vault of the heavens above us um, at the neutral point of the polarity reversal just, bef uh, just before the plasma ap apocalypse comes. So you can see that you have an inner circle. This one's kind of rosy. It actually has some flowery roses coming out of it, just like the plasma would. So this is sort of um, like a subliminal eyeball. And they have a few of these in the movie too. So we skip forward the kid. Oh, actually they, they zoom in. It's hard to see, but this is a picture, an old print. And they show you this sort of old lady with like a rag over her head. Something that you would think of when you think of a traditional witch. You know what I mean? We don't typically, when we think of witches, we, 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 when we think of bad guys, Hey, thanks Bill. I appreciate you. That's very kind. Thank you. When we think of the bad guys, we tend to make them ugly. But is that the reality? Not in my experience. My experience is quite the opposite. Quite often, I've found that the bad guys are some of the most beautiful, pretty, prettiest looking people um, that I've seen walking around this world, right? Typically, the bad guys come in the, in the guise of a big smile and a treat or something like that to try to get you, entice you to come onto their side. So boom, the kid wakes up. He's in some sort of a cupboard that has a picture of a tree on it. So he's literally coming up out of a tree in this imagery. Now, for me, this represents the world tree, the place right in the middle at the North Pole of our world where there is, the legends say, there is an entrance into the earth itself, a huge entrance, a cavernous opening that from time to time is empty and you could go down into it. It sort of becomes a cave. You know, gravity kind of flips towards the walls and you can just walk right in and go into this huge cave into the earth. And um, 
the other half of the time, there's a beam of plasma that shoots up from inside of our own world, shoots up through that cavernous opening, um, and goes up and hits up and hits the sky. Now that blue beam is the signal that the apocalypse is officially over, that the energy has reversed and is now going the opposite direction, which for us, the next dire direction will be upwards. All the energy is coming down at us from above right now, wrapping around our world. That energy will reverse, the polarity will reverse, and all that energy and light and everything will go upwards. Um, obviously not, not the light from the sun, but the light from the plasma surrounding our world that creates the focal point. So he comes up out of that tree, just like so many legends have talked about. Sophia and Gnosticism, you've got the tree of life and the garden of Eden, etc. All right, so he comes out into this strange apartment. He doesn't recognize it, and he's like, where am I? That's one of the first things that happens in the post-apocalyptic world. The survivors tend to wake up because many of them actually pass out. Um, many many people who, who survived the apocalypse... Um, will actually pass out um, for, for many different reasons. Some from sheer fright, uh, some from various gases that are released, some for other reasons. Um, but a lot of people I've found tend to black out or pass out during this event. I think one of the biggest culprits is probably going to be the depressurization of our atmosphere. When that happens, it's going to be difficult for a lot of people to breathe and people will already be in shock. I mean, I can see a lot of people just, oh my God, passing right out. So anyways, we, he wakes up he and says, where am I? That's where a lot of people are going to say when they wake up too. Somebody in the chat mentioned the, the video game Fortnite. And in that game, they also have people who land on an island and they don't know where they are. They lose their memories. That happens a lot. We see that theme everywhere. So he goes immediately to the window. He doesn't know where he is. He wants out of there, right? He's trying to get out. So he looks out of the window. He's way up there. He can't get out. He's like, help, help. I'm trapped. Mom, you know, somebody, somebody help me out. So he jumps through the window and boom, does he land outside? No, it's like it transported him right back into this magical apartment complex or building, whatever it is, this house, this magic house. And he can't get out when he tried to go through the exit that he saw that looks like an exit. It just took him right back inside. Now, remember, this could represent our world on a larger scale or on a smaller scale, I should say, right? So trying to get out of here and a lot of, I believe a lot of the elites of our world, who, the people that run our world, um, that they're working on plans to leave here, that they feel trapped here because, um, you know, they claim a uh, lineage that comes from the immortals themselves. And many of them have claimed to fi have figured out the secrets or some secrets to immortality. And they realize that when they're in here and that boundary goes back up over our world and the polarity is restored, you can't get out until the next time it goes down. So they're often talking about in music and stuff like that, how they, they want to get out of here. They feel trapped in here and things like that. So he's like, help, help. And all of a sudden it starts getting creepy. Electricity is sort of cackling off left and right. The lights are flickering. Electromagnetic phenomenon, right? So who represents this electromagnetic phenomenon? This woman enters into the room. She's some mysterious shadowy lady. And she says, what is your name? Now, this is interesting because that's the first thing she wants to know. She needs something from him off the bat. But he's so scared, he just gives it to her, right? Uh, my, my name? My name is Alex. And he just says his name. This is interesting to me. Why? Because in demonology... One of the first things that people learn is um, that it's crucial to get the names of demons who are in the area of entities, whatever it may be, because if you have the name, then you have power, allegedly, over the entity or the entity does not have as much power over you. So she clearly knows something like that and asks what his name is. I don't think she's trying to get to know him or anything. Uh, she's an evil witch. She probably doesn't care to get to know him. <clears throat> So she stands there, he's freaking out, and then boom. Oh, she's like a beautiful, pretty lady. Okay, well, that's that's a little surprising. She goes, boo, right? <laughs> We're expecting some... Actually, she was wearing a mask at first of some old hag-looking person with a big old nose and a big mole on it. You know, like a typical witch, right? So she immediately jumps right in. She's wearing the red for the plasma, but she also is represented throughout this entire movie by a baby blue color. 
Okay. Now the baby blue color is the light that shoots up out of the entrance to the inner world and shoots up to the sky. And that's the signal that we now have entered into a magical existence. Okay. An energetic, an energetic influx, um, that will supply technology and abilities that we only consider to be fringe and sort of off limits to even talk about or consider today. Unless of course we're talking about fantasy, which we are, or are we bum, bum, bum. <laughs> she says, let's get this over with. I'm a busy witch. Okay. So she's a witch. There's a witch inside of the house, right? Just, there's always going to be some sort of like, if you go into the labyrinth, there's always going to be a minotaur. There's always some sort of monster chasing after us inside of this house that we live in, inside of this world that we live in. There's something chasing after us to try to manipulate us, control us, or get us off track, right? To take us away from the point of living, trying to figure it all out. <clears throat> so she stands above him, or she overstands, and he is standing under, or understanding. Um, and then it shows the closet. Now, this is full of clothing from children that the apartment, okay, or the house has eaten or devoured in the past, kidnapping all of these children. She says, that's what, the, that's what the apartment does. They were not useful to me. She's talking about these children, right? The people or the beings that were not useful to her died. She got them, right? So interesting. What does that mean to be of use to the witch that's locked inside of this house with us? Is there anything special about you at all? So she asks this kid, is there anything special about you? Like, should I keep you around or should I kill you? right? Anything special about you? Any reason I should let you live? Right? And she levitates him now, right? So he's like, no, not really. He doesn't see his own value. God, man, this is what this movie is all about. Okay. If you, if you know somebody, especially somebody younger that feels like maybe they don't see their own worth or their value, or they feel like an outcast or a black sheep or something, boom, this is the movie to watch. So she levitates him. Interesting. So now she's associated with levitation and people floating up into the air. So she levitates him and basically threatens him. He looks down and sees his notebook of scary stories that he's so proud of that he's written. And he was on his way to go burn that when she caught him, when the house caught him. And he says, I do write scary stories. I mean, I'm good at that, right? So the house starts to rumble. The house is like, what scary stories? Oh, and it starts to shake and make noises and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, well, well, what's that? What's going on? And she's like, no more questions. Right. That's the first thing. That's the first thing. The first time she says that she actually tells him and other people do throughout this movie that he should really stop asking so many questions. Now, the people that tell him to stop asking questions don't really represent the side of good in the movie. So do we experience that in our world where people are like, stop asking questions. Don't ask so many questions. Stop looking into things so deep. Stop getting so deep with things. Right. Okay. So she grabs his book and he's like, I was going to burn them in the boiler room downstairs. So she's like, oh, you write scary stories. You're going to write me a scary story every night or you die essentially. And she doesn't tell us why, but she says the story better be good and it better be scary. Right now, here's the thing. If, if this is the world, if this is our world that we live in and this witch who's in there with us, this, this woman who represents magic and power and things like that is demanding that we give her a scary story. Sounds kind of like Monsters, Inc. and some other things, right? Where the bad guys try to get the fear out of us. They thrive on fear. They want that adrenaline. They want that energy that we produce when we get super afraid of something, right? As opposed to the energy we produce when we laugh, just like in Monsters, Inc. She says, or it's the last thing you'll do. Ah, ha, 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 ha. She doesn't laugh like that. <laughs> and then it shows us this cat, right? Uh, it's a little hairless cat, which is interesting, and gigantic blue eyes. Um, it's also said that the, the other worldly beings that come into this world tend to have, um, you know, either blue or red eyes as well. So it's pretty interesting. The cat represents the same color, that sort of blue color with its eyes. Now, the cat is not 
a friendly cat to, to begin with. So it attacks this kid and he gets away. It actually can change and turn invisible. Just like the Cheshire Cat. Interesting. What's the thing about cats? What do you guys think the thing about cats are? Esoteric symbolism behind the cats, right? I speculate, one of my theories is that the cats, the dogmen, the batmen, all of these pointy-eared furry creature men or women tend to represent the elven race when they get older and they go beyond the years of puberty in their immortality or their immortal bodies, right? Or their seemingly immortal bodies. They get really hairy and stuff like that. Giant ears, giant nose. So Alex says, what is this place? Do you see that? Little uh, plasma strands on the wall there. They show that a lot in this movie too. And then he starts walking around. He's like, whoa, where am I? What is this place? Look at this picture. They only show this one time. And at first, it's hard to see, but you sort of see like some lunar cycles here or something. And there's a circle and there's like this, I don't know, spikes coming off of it. But... Subliminally, this is another all-seeing eye staring down at us, right? It, it also kind of looks like it might be something that's like falling down or something, like maybe fire is jetting off of it from behind. So he's like, what is this place? This is crazy. He's looking around, right? He just got kidnapped by a magical house and introduced to an evil, uh, possibly child-eating witch or something. And the next day, he's free to roam about, right? All he has to do is write a story by nighttime, a scary story. So he's checking it everything out, and what does he say? What does he notice? Where's the t where's the TV? Where they don't have a TV? <laughs> like that blew that blew my mind. Okay, like ah, uh, sometimes I talk to the movies while I'm while I'm watching them. I will talk like what? Are you serious? I had to I had to rewind this part just because this blew my mind because that. That's kids today, right? I mean, where's the? T what am I gonna do without a TV? Like, pfft. it's just like it's like a museum that where nothing moves, like a museum. <laughs> so yeah, that's interesting. And then he says, "Where'd the front door go?" So check this out. The front door used to be right here. Interesting to me because symbolically, here's one wall with an opening, but the second wall that should have an opening no longer does. That second wall is closed off now. It's been sealed up magically. Interesting, because we may have two walls, or more possibly, but I think probably two, to our own world, right? Two skies, two barriers, two boundaries above. All right, so then we look in to her little display shelf and she's got all these little like frozen um, miniatures of these children that, that the house has captured over the years and essentially uh, preserves them as little figurines in the house. So he starts walking around, he meets another girl and she's, and he's like, Oh my God, you're a kid. And the girl's like, and you're a genius. Hey, Tegra, the 25th. Thank you. Production and design. I appreciate you. So this girl says, and you're a genius, right? Now check this out. She's immediately representing like not a good vibe, right? She's, she's trying to insult this kid by being sarcastic. However, she's actually complimenting him. Um, he really is a genius. He does all of this stuff that nobody else, that many people can't do. And he's really good at it, right? Not only that, but just the word genius is interesting because in the olden days, genius equated to demon. The word demon didn't used to be demonized. Can you imagine that? Um, it just, it, it, it actually could have been used as a compliment. People, um, would say demon, but they meant somebody who is extraordinarily smart or a genius, right? People that can do mir seemingly miraculous things with their intellect. So he says, are you a prisoner here too? So they're both prisoners inside of this little miniature world that they've just entered into. That's basically like a gigantic TARDIS. <laughs> like if the TARDIS was an apartment complex, this is the TARDIS. She says, I hope you like peanut butter. So throughout the movie, that's pretty much all they have to eat is peanut butter and jelly because they're kids, I'm assuming, I don't know, but they have peanut butter and jelly and that's it. Now look at the name that's on that peanut butter. Can you see that? It's hard to see, but it says pop it, pop it, peanut butter, pop it. That's weird. I've heard that before somewhere. So I looked it up because remember on Pirates of the Caribbean when they find the girl and he's like, hello, pop it, right? So what does pop it mean? That's interesting. I looked it up. If you look it up on Google, you'll read that in magic and witchcraft, a poppet, also known as poppet, moppet, mommel, and pippy, which I also assume where the word muppet came from, by the way, 
is a doll made to represent a person. For casting spells on that person or to aid that person through magic. They are occasionally found lodged in chimneys. Puppets are also used as kitchen witch figures. So isn't that interesting that they put that in the movie? There's no such peanut butter as poppet. Pe- I never heard of that. Have you heard of that? It could be real. I don't know. Regardless, they purposefully put that in the kitchen, not explaining it whatsoever. Interesting. Do they expect people like you and I to actually go and Google stuff and look it up and research it? Possibly. We're going to get to that because I believe that they do. All right. So we'll get past the poppets. Uh, He said, oh, she's she's warning the boy, Alex. She says, don't ever think Natasha won't miss this piece of popcorn or something. She's warning him, don't take anything. Just eat peanut butter and jelly. Natasha is the name of the witch. Guess what Natasha means? She's represented by this bluish, whitish kind of light, this magical blue light. Um, And she lives inside of this house that captures people and traps them there. Natasha means born on Christmas. Interesting. So as far as the bad guy or bad woman goes in this movie, we've got somebody whose name means born on Christmas, represented by a blue light, and lives inside of some sort of a magical house that traps people inside of it. Hmm. Here it is right here. Uh, Natasha, the Na- Natasha, primarily a female name of Russian origin that means born on Christmas Day. Diminutive form of Natalia. So we go back to this girl and she says Lenore tells the witch everything. Lenore is the name of that skinless cat. Uh, I can't remember what Lenore means. I think it means light, I believe, if I'm correct. And Lenore is also the name of a very famous poem written by Edgar Allan Poe. And it's about this girl or this, this guy or this boy who has this like deep love and she dies way too early, like way before her time. And that's what this cat is named after. Oh, here it is right here. The name Lenore is primarily a female name of French origin and it means light or a form of Eleanor. Lenore is also a poem by Edgar Allan Poe. So she's talking about the apartment, the magical house that they are trapped in now. And she says, talk about the ultimate passport. This apartment is it. The apartment travels all over the world, luring kids in. So this is really interesting. I want to time out real quick because this movie is also associated with kidnapping of children or missing children, right? Now, those of us who have looked into or those of you who have looked into like and studied the mud floods of recent history going back and looking at the older pictures from like mid to mid 1800s to like late 1800 or uh, mid 1900s, I guess you could say like early 1900s. Uh, there's a lack of children, either that, or there's so many children, but their, their pictures are only shown in orphanages and stuff. There's a lot of missing children. It seems to be had in the early 1800s. Now I believe that whenever these resets happen, to our world from time to time occasionally that when the blue beam shoots up into our world that it extends our lifespans that it actually promotes growth and healing and magical abilities and things like that right mostly good attributes but because if our lifespans are lengthened that means that the age to reach puberty will also be lengthened, which means it's going to take a long time before people ever see a newborn baby again, right? So I think that's that's one theory that I have as to where that stems from. Now, they go into this magical library room, which I love. I love this one. This is a huge library. It shoots up to you know the very top of this building and stuff. And you can see here's another one of those subliminal all-seeing eyes. If you blur your eyes and you look at it, you can see the big circle are on the outside, smaller circle on the inside. There's actually like twisting spirals on the inside of this one and rays of light shooting out of that one. And there's spiral staircases all over the place too. And I talked about that when you see the spiral staircase in movies, that's representing traveling into Wonderland, going into uh, the red world or the, our sister world or leaving this blue sky and entering into the red sky, right? Um, which people can do through the plasma conduit above our world or the one that goes into the inner earth. So he's checking it out, looking around. And she says the apartment can do two things. It lures suckers like us into it. And it has room to hold 
Well, anything, right? It has room to hold anything. Why is it that this can hold anything? I did a video about magic bags one time. You know how Mary Poppins has a magic bag, reaches in, she can pull out anything, literally. Uh, Merlin from the Sword in the Stone has a magic bag. He can reach in, pull out anything, literally. You can put anything inside of it. The TARDIS is bigger on the inside. You could put anything inside of it or, you know, it, the list goes on and on. That's what our world is. Our world can take things into it and shrink them down in size. Once the world starts to build up pressure again and that blue beam goes away, then everything gets smaller and smaller and smaller and shrinks down and it can hold anything. There's a lot of stuff in our world. So he's checking out the library, looking around and he's like, wow, this is amazing. Oh my, look at all these books. Holy cow, that witch really does like stories. And he's starting to get excited, right? Because that's his inner nature. That's him really getting excited about it. He can't, he can't hide it anymore. He was really upset. He, he was really upset about, you know, being so into horror and stuff and he hated his stories or whatever it was. And now he's getting all excited seeing all these books, just like Bell and, um, Beauty and the Beast. Right. So then he's like, uh, she, the girl's like, well, I thought you didn't like, uh, I thought you didn't like stories and stuff like that. And he's like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's my friend. He's, he's really lame, you know, he's, he's, he's stupid or whatever. So now he starts to try to, he's just being fake at this point and he's not even good at it. He's not even good at faking it, right? You can tell, bro, come on, you're clearly excited about these stories and this books, all these books and stuff. And she says, this is your life now. Okay. They're trapped in this world together. She says, this is your life now. Forget your family, forget your friends for, uh, focus on being useful to Natasha. You want to live Write scary stories. Why? Because the witch said, if you don't write scary stories, I'm going to kill you basically. Right? So she's saying, if you want to live, you need to write scary stories. However, the flip side of that coin is she saying, you're acting like one of these dead people. You're acting like one of these zombies out here. Do you want to live? I mean, do you want to really live? Every man dies, but not every man really lives. Right? From Braveheart. So if you really want to live, kid, write your stories. Don't go burn them. Don't go trash them and stuff. Own up to who you are on the inside. Be proud of who you are on the inside. We're going to come back to that subject here in a bit too. He says, I'm not going to write anything. Forget it. So he tries to escape. Um, he's waiting for the witch to come in. He finds that there's a second entrance into the house. This house has two entrances. Our world has two entrances. One up there in the sky, one down there in the ground. So he's hiding, waiting for the witch to enter in. And he's like, whoa, another exit. And then he runs for it, right? <laughs> he's trying to get there as fast as he can, but he stopped instantly. Bzzz. There's this electrical crackling and the door disappears and the boundary goes back up. As you can see, it's sort of a blue, a blue boundary. We'll say it right there. <laughs> and he's stuck in the house, right? There's this electromagnetic field keeping him from leaving. Interesting. So she says, there's no escape. Why do you guys always try to run? Right? And then she says, do you understand? And she gets really serious. And when she gets upset, her eyes start to light up, right? That's because she has an influx of plasma. So whenever people have an influx of energy or spirit or plasma, whatever you'd like to call it, essentially they're what I call the plasma possessed. It could lean towards the good, could lean towards the bad. So first night, he's got to, he's got to share his first story, his first scary story, the playground now, this is interesting. You see this little tidbit here in the corner? That says the blue hour. It's kind of hard to see, but it says the blue hour down there in the corner. What is the blue hour? Well, I'm going to tell you symbolically, it's not an hour. Sometimes an hour can, can be symbolic of a time. You know how we say like once upon a time? You could easily replace that with once upon an hour or whatever, right? So this is the blue time, the blue hour, the time when the blue beam is shooting up into our world, introducing and reintroducing magic into our world, electromagnetic influx, allowing us to, allowing all sorts of interesting and magical and wondrous changes, not just within us and about us, but our world as well. All right, so 
She starts to get out this little bottle of like spritzy, misty blue stuff. And he's like, what's that? She says, you know what happens to children who ask too many questions, right? Now, I want to ask you this. As we go through this, and maybe those of you, you know, who are interested in checking out the movie or whatever, just think about it. Is this lady automatically bad? Is she automatically evil? Like, uh, aside from, you know, the fact that she's, the, the house is kidnapping kids and stuff like that. Sometimes we need this type of a character. Sometimes we need this type of an energy to boost us into the right direction. And I see that a lot in this movie as well. So, you know what happens to kids who ask too many questions, right? Have you heard that one before? Don't, why are you asking so many questions? Because I said so. Stop talking. Stop, stop. Just do what you're told. Ever hear that one? So she sprays this blue mist all over her, right? And she inhales it. She, mm, she sucks it up. And ultimately what happens, she has these little perfume bottles filled with this blue mist. And that blue mist is this power. It's, it's the thing that gives her her power. All of her witch power comes from this blue mist. Interesting. All right, let's move on. So she sprays it. She gets high off of the blue power. She's feeling it. She's plasma possessed to the max. And then she's like, why did you bur Why do you want to burn your stories? Right? She wants to know. She's really actually interested in that. She wants to know why'd you burn your, why, why do you want to go burn all your stories? Why is she asking him that? Is it because she's the bad guy? And she's just genuinely making conversation about like, she's, she's concerned about him, you know? Hmm. So whenever the house hears that he was going to burn all of his scary stories, the house starts to grumble and rumble. The house does not like that. Okay. The house loves scary stories and it's getting upset that, um, essentially he's going to read bedtime stories to the house. And that's not really to the witch as you'll see. So he opens up the book. Oh yeah. He's like, what's that? All right. He opens up the book. He starts to read. Okay. So he reads the first story called dun, 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 the playground. Interesting. Let's check out what the playground's about. So they have these little cheesy animations for his stories as he reads them. As you can see, we've got a red sky. There's a playground, there's a fence, etc. The playground represents our world. Okay. On the, the microscopic scale and or on the smaller scale. And then she stops him immediately. She stops him, right? She does this a lot. She interrupts. She jumps in there and she starts criticizing his work. She's like, no, 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 no. Sorry. No, no, no. That's wrong. Nope. Nope. Sorry. Everyone knows that ghosts haunt places that are personal to them because he says that these ghosts are haunting this public park or whatever, right? Well, wait a minute. Time out. Because I, I, would, I would definitely disagree with that. I would say that ghosts don't always haunt places that are personal to them. Um, like I've talked about uh, with the plasma apocalypse, I believe that we will have a ghost apocalypse, if you would like to call it that, where um, not only do the dead rise from their graves and we have zombies who are actually corporal, but we have pockets of energy and spirit moving about all over the place that don't even have bodies to get into. There's so much spirit everywhere. There's so much life everywhere. And I believe that we'll be able to see uh, these apparitions all over the place and live with them for, for a time. So she starts criticizing him. She's like, not public places, right? He goes back to the story. He tries to justify it. And he says, Todd walks to the playground and he gets to the gate. And as soon as his foot crosses the threshold, boom, there's all these children. All these children are playing around on the playground. And what they want to do is trick him into coming and playing with them as well. Because the legend says that whoever is on the playground playing with these ghost kids, when the sun comes up, they will also be stuck on that playground playing forever. Now, another word for playing is acting. All the world's a stage. All the men and women are merely players. We're here playing. We're all children playing about. I mean, can you imagine us compared to an immortal? If you actually met a being that lived to be over a thousand years old or something, we would be children. Even our most bearded, aged, gray haired individual would look and appear like a child to them. Anna Marie Chavez, thank you. I appreciate your donation. Thank you. All right, so. Uh, this one kid comes up to him. He says, maybe he's 10 or so. He's dressed like a newsie from the 20s, right? 
And he says that they're all dressed like that. Really interesting that they're dressed from this like style from a long time ago, right? That's how the gods themselves are described as dressing, okay? Or vampires or whatever you want to call it. They, they always have a gaudy sense of dress. They have an old gothic kind of look to them. And that's why they bring it into this new world with vampires and they have them dressed up in old clothing and stuff like that because that's the time they're from. They've been alive for quite some time. So he says, I'm looking for my friend Jenny. He's out looking for her. Do you see how he's got little lightning bolts all over him? So he comes into the world, this world of the dead, essentially, where these kids are trying to find his friend. It's almost like the story in uh, Greek mythology where there was this one god who was in love with this goddess and she was dragged down into Hades. So he he risked it all to go down into the earth to go find her and to bring her out, right? also symbolic of Sophia or the blue beam, etc. So he's looking for her. He says their skin is deathly white. Some of their clothes date back for decades. Let me tell you something. I don't know how many, I haven't seen a lot of de- actual dead people. Okay. Maybe like one. Okay. Not a lot. Um, but something in my head tells me that they're not, they don't just turn white when they die. Like rotting bodies don't just turn like white. I could be wrong. You could throw it in the chat. Like if if you've seen dead people, if they're, if they turn like albino white or something like that, let me know. Maybe they do. I don't know. I'm sure the body drains of blood or something, but I believe the reason that they make these beings that white like that, like vampires, right? Vampires shouldn't be white because just because they're dead, because they're not dead. They're undead. Okay. Like they have, they have to have like blood coursing through their body to make the body actually move and work and stuff like that. There has to be some science behind the fiction. There has to be some truth to the story. And that's what this movie actually reminds us of many times. So they push Todd on a swing higher and higher. And then she's like, uh, no, excuse me. Everyone knows ghosts don't have actual physical hands. Wait a minute, time out. She's starting to sound a lot like mainstream academia or like, you know, all of the lemmings in the world that just say, oh, that's retarded. Oh, that's stupid. That sounds too far-fetched. You're a witch. (laughs) Like, are you serious? You're a witch. You're telling me this sounds too far-fetched? So they could never push him on a swing. She's just totally ripping into his work, right? So he's like, well, it's a mix between the spirit world and the real world. So anyway, any living child still on the playground when the sun rises is cursed to remain there forever. Just like in our world, whenever any child, any human, any being that enters into this world and is still here by the time that door shuts and the plasma apocalypse is over with and the polarity reverses back the other way and that magnetic shield around our world goes back up is stuck until the next time it goes down. But this world is spinning, or his world, he's telling the story, his world is spinning. He's tripping over his own feet. This kid's trying to get out of the playground. He doesn't want to get stuck there forever. All of the ghost children watch in suspense. <gasps> Are they going to, is he going to join? Is it going to be some new, fresh character to play with, you know? And she's, and then, oh, okay. So then he ends the story and he's like, and he makes it. The girl, Jenny pushes him. She saves him. He's totally good. And he's like, oh, I'll miss you. And she's like, I'll always be here in your heart or something like that. And and then the witch loses her mind, right? The witch is like a happy ending, a happy ending. No happy endings. You fool. She's pissed. She's livid, right? The house starts to shake. The house is pissed. The house does not like this whatsoever, right? So she busts out her levitation Alohomora or whatever it is. <laughs> and he, he starts to float up into the, into the, you know, he floats up basically. And, uh, she's the one responsible for it. Interesting. So that the blue beam is also associated with people floating up into the air. Usually it's depicted in pop culture by UFOs or tractor beams, <laughs> sucking up some individual or cow or something to be mutilated or probed. All right. So she lets him go. He begged for his life. And you can see the little plasma deal but there behind him. She says, happy endings are a dangerous thing. You notice how her pearl necklace is just extra, super extra, right? To the point of where it almost looks like a spider web. Interesting. Kind of like grandmother spider. 
She says this beautiful darkness dances inside your brain. You should celebrate it. But you run from it. Why? So she asks him again. She's really interested in hearing a story. And he keeps making up all these other stories or whatever that are great. But she's really interested in hearing more about his story in particular. So he says, I just want to be like everyone else. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I can. S- that's the problem. That's what the movie's all about. That's the whole problem. of the. In, in any story, you have to have a problem. Boy, your problem is you want to be like everybody else. We're going to fix that. Or actually, he's going to fix it himself. He has to realize it deep down inside. That's where it always comes from. But in here, this little girl, she's like, she's right, you know. Happy endings don't exist. So check this out. Here's the problem with modern society, okay? Since our last apocalyptic reset, we have had generation pass and generation pass, and it only takes a couple, two or three of them before we just completely forget what even happened. And then some survivors might even change the story. Because remember, some people wake up with amnesia, don't know what's going on, don't know where they are, don't know who they are. But some people remember. Some people share the information, which is usually not believed because it's too fantastic. And some people keep the information to themselves. So the problem is this little girl represents so many of us who have lived here for so long that we feel like happy endings don't exist. Our world just sucks. It's going to suck forever. Our world is terrible. It's full of all kinds of disgusting evils. People are wronged. Good people, you know, bad things are happening to good people left and right all of the time. So she's resigned to that. She's given up. She says they don't, happy endings don't exist here. And by here, she means the world that we live in right? Why is that? Well, I believe that it's been so long since that blue beam has retracted back into our world, no longer supplying our world with spirit and energy and an influx of electromagnetic power, that everything has become weakened and smaller and lifespans have shrank and life has shrank itself, right? And what that means is all of that blue beam, which, which gives healing to the world and strengthens our souls and extends our lives and stuff, it dies. It retreats. It's taken down into Hades or the depths of the world or whatever. And it's not to be seen again for quite some time. And we long for it. We long for those good old days, the magic days, the days where we can truly be ourselves and be free and have our happy endings. Uh, the plasma apocalypse, to me, some people might see the apocalypse as something terrible. Actually, most people from my research regard it as some sort of a negative topic, right? All doom and gloom and uh, everyone's going to die. The world's going to explode and blow up. And it's just, there's no happy ending even to that. But the reality is it's not the end of the world. It's the end of life as we knew it as we were used to it. It's going to change. Now, to some people, it might actually be the end of your personal world because some people might die. (laughs) Uh, Actually, a lot of people will. Uh, It's not a laughing matter. It's actually something that I mourn for, um, but I also see the reality behind it. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. It needs to happen. And so it will. Um, in the Jewish religion, they actually have an entire time of mourning, a holiday specifically to mourn those people who would die in the upcoming events during their version of the apocalypse. So this kid is trying to think of a story to write, a scary story, right? He's trying to, he's trying to rejog his creative mind. He seems to be having writer's block. He looks up at all those spiral staircases and he sees what looks like a six pointed star up there in the vault of the heavens of that apartment complex. And he says, once upon a time, he's trying to, trying to start up a story for himself. He's right. Trying to give it a kickstart. Once upon a time, Alex stared up at the ceiling. Then the ceiling fell on him and put him out of his misery. The end. That was his story. Isn't that interesting? Because to me, that's actually the story for many people. Like people wander about staring up at the sky, wondering who we are, where we came from, etc. And then the sky literally falls on us and the apocalypse comes. People forget their purpose. People forget why we came into this world in the first place. People forget why we're here and lose sight of all the good news, of all the happy endings. Right? There's a purpose behind all of it. 
the purpose I refuse to believe is just pure evil. It's got to be balanced out. It will be balanced out every single time. And if the world's that bad right now, that just means that only good can come. <laughs> only good can come. X-Ray, welcome. Welcome to my channel. And to the Good Vibe Tribe. All right, so this kid is trying to think of a story. He goes up to the very top, grabs the oldest book he can find, and flips through. There's all kinds of cool stories. There's like Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, Hansel and Gretel. So he opens up to Hansel and Gretel, and somebody had scribbled out the picture of the witch. He's like, that's interesting. There's Frankenstein. He opens up that. Frankenstein, since we're coming up on Halloween, just so you know, I believe Frankenstein is has the potential to be an actual true story where body parts are pieced together, but there's so much energy or so much spirit in the world, you could piece together almost anything and make a creation, make something, some sort of new life come about as it gets incorporated by the plasma itself. So he starts reading through these books, these ancient books that are up on the top of the library and stuff. And when he starts reading through these older stories, he sees that somebody had written a diary in random books. So in this particular book, he reads a portion of somebody's diary. It says, I saw a unicorn, which is really interesting too. We're going to get back to the unicorn symbolism here in a bit. People said they didn't exist but there it was. They're talking about the unicorn. Whoever wrote in this diary said, I saw a unicorn. People say they don't exist, but boom, there was one right there. That's me. That's our, that's many of us out here, right? We talk about and speculate and remember and cherish topics like things that others say that that's ridiculous. That's nonsense. That doesn't exist. That's not real. That's too much, man. Why don't you just believe what everyone else believes? Uh, you know? So this kid's interested. He's like, wow, somebody else that saw something that everyone else didn't think was real. And uh, he says, it goes on to say, I followed it into this apartment and now I'm trapped by a witch. Interesting. So the apartment is this world. Remember, uh, the witch is representative of a few different things. One of those is being... Um, like the gods that come into this world, but it's also the blue beam because of the blue... Uh, the blue color that's associated with her throughout this movie. And then she follows a unicorn. Whoever this is followed a unicorn into the world in order to get here and, and to become trapped. So what is the unicorn? I'd, I'm going to let you guys think about that. We're gonna I'm going to come back to the unicorn here in a bit. Um, but the Red Hot Chili Peppers come to mind. I think it was that song Snow when they're like, first born unicorn, right? That's part of the lyrics. All right, so to a vampire, blood does taste like candy. He's starting to read again. He's reading the stories to her. So it's another night. He's trying to scare the witch lady or whatever. She's totally not even phased. Everybody knows it takes two days to grow full fangs. She's just, she's just nitpicking on his stories. The Grim Reaper doesn't have a pet. Isn't that right, Lenore? Mm, interesting, right? She's also acting as the Grim Reaper in this movie. Um, and then she asks her pet, isn't that right? The Grim Reaper doesn't have a pet. Clearly she has a pet right there in front of her, right? So what is she really trying to do, right? Is she just a super hypocrite or is she trying to make a point to this kid to teach him something? So the witch Natasha, which means born on Christmas day, uh, is ridiculing and critiquing his story because he says that there was this, teddy bear that came to life and it was sentient and they saw the teddy bear's tracks in the ground or whatever and she's like possessed teddy bears really uh right just giving super attitude well yeah actually possessed teddy bears whenever that plasma comes in into our world it can incorporate itself or go into a body which means it's what incorporate means right to go in the corpse or in corporal um and it looks for bodies. It looks for stuff to possess the plasma, the spirit. It would like, since it's in our world and trapped in our world, it would like to live in our world instead of just being a wandering spirit forever. You know what I mean? So they jump into bodies. They jump into vessels. It does not have to be a flesh and bone body. I don't believe it has to be a flesh and bone body. Uh, the, the electromagnetics can jump into robots and toys and automobiles and cars and seemingly, if not in actual reality, bring them to life. So 
she's like, it took me right out of the story. Nah, I'm not interested. And she says, every good story hints at truth. He's actually telling her a good story. Every good story hints at truth. So do you think that the movie that we're watching, if it if if the movie says that every good story, and this movie is a story, and hopefully the people that made it would consider it to be a good story, don't you think they would have included some truth in all of this crazy fictitious stuff about witches and magic houses and stuff? Hmm, probably. The more truth, the more powerful the story. This is a good one. <laughs> All right, so this kid, uh, it's the next day, he walks into this garden room. The witch has this garden room where all of the plants, there's no sunlight, there's no you know white light from light bulbs and stuff like that. They only have like UV light, ultraviolet light. And the plants all glow and they flourish under this new type of light. I also believe that plants in our world after the apocalypse will look almost alien. A lot of plants will grow to sizes that we don't even, we won't even recognize them um, because they're so big. We're not used to seeing them that big. They'll be able to move rapidly about, almost look like they're just animated and they could just probably talk or something like that. Um, I'm not saying that they could talk. However, that's not outside the realm of possibility with amplified energy and telepathy, right? Connecting one energy to another energy. Anyhow, so we got this sort of nighttime mode. Our world, I believe, goes into this sort of dusky type of light, right? When the sky turns red. In some areas, it'll be red, but because there's a blue beam that shoots up as well, that red mixed with the blue beam and the surrounding light from that will create purple in some areas. So she says, this is Natasha's night nursery. Yeah, sunlight is bad for magical plants, right? Interesting. I think a lot of our plants are going to grow to look alien and look strange. Under different conditions, they, they will naturally adapt. They will naturally change or reveal their true selves, right? What if all the plants that we look at are like undeveloped versions of their potential, of what they should be if they had full bloom life? You know what I mean? An influx of life or different conditions even. All right. So he's asking questions. He's like, what's this giant spider web over here? And she's like, enough questions. Help me with this. Now, do you see that? This girl is so droned out. She represents people who are used to being stuck in this world. She just wants us. She just, she just is expected to just do her job. She works for the witch, right? The witch has to find people who are useful. And she's just resigned to just being content just being a slave and being the slave of the witch and she in turn is copying the witch's attitude saying don't ask questions man stop asking questions see she's doing that because she's afraid of the witch the witch is doing that under um trying to give them duress under threats and stuff like that right so the people act in turn um they act like those who oppress them often uh, Alex says, where's this blue mist come from? Do you make it? And she's like, what? Well, hey, what's up, John? John Koza, welcome. Uh, she says, the mist. Do you think Do you think it keeps Natasha young? So this guy thinks that the, this blue mist has something to do with keeping her young or youthful. The fountain of youth, the blue beam, the mist that comes up out of our world. Like the, our atmosphere literally expands during worldwide depressurization and turns everything, our air, into mist in many places or fog. She says it's none of our business. Not pff, really, really. This see, she represents so many people that have just... They just hang their heads and they're like, forget it. I'm a slave. I'm not fighting. I'm not standing up for myself. I'm not going to just, I'm not going to show my character. I'm definitely not going to try to explore or go beyond any boundaries that have been set for me. She is accepted her role as a slave, right? A slave in the world or a slave of the world. Now out of these eggshell things pop out these creepy Tim Burton looking claymation fanazoid things. <laughs> um, Oh, and for those of you who are new to my channel, Phantasoids are otherworldly creatures that float down into our world during that neutral gravitational point or uh, pole shift. And they land safely in our world and there's all, there's 
probably thousands upon thousands, if not millions upon millions of them in all different forms. Now, some of those have been talked about in various ancient scriptures and writings, and they talk about how some of them are here to attack. Some are here sort of neutral and some actually seem to be benevolent. Now, this one jumps right at her face. I call this a face hugger or a face sucker, right? The dream crab. These things tend to try to latch right on and... In my research of these things, looking into the fantastic, they do that and then they induce a dreamlike state, right? It doesn't happen on this one because she's protected. She's got some protection over her face, so it can't attach to her face. But I have seen that in other movies. So they go before the witch again. She does her little levitation spell, uh, Leviosa or whatever it is, right? I forgot all the Harry Potter stuff. Um... So they're up there just floating in the air. And then it says that they're grunting and gasping, which to me implies that they're having a hard time breathing. So levitating and having a hard time breathing is also an event that happens when our world depressurizes. Okay. When all that pressure, boom, shoots up from the North pole, goes out into what people would call space these days or the heavens or whatever. I call it the fractal verse. Um, when that happens, all of our air and atmosphere and stuff literally just starts to get sucked upwards straight up. Um, I imagine it'll be quiet, just like, you know, being in a vacuum or something like that for a little while. And it will be difficult to breathe during this event. Not impossible, but difficult. Uh, so she's got the thing on her. She's, they're all lifted up by the witch or whatever. And she says, can't you do anything right? I said, keep your eyes open. Now, for some reason, she wants this girl to keep her eyes open. The second she says that, the girl opens her eyes and has the most ridiculous, gigantic, crazy smile. She's actually like crying, but it looks like she's laughing. It looks like she's laughing ridiculous. Like she, look how big that smile is. That's from the Black Hole Sun video. Have you guys seen that by Soundgarden, the Black Hole Sun, where people have like these crazy extra gigantic smiles during some sort of an apocalyptic event? Um, I call that the laughing plague, right? I believe there's pockets of NO2, little clouds of NO2 that float around places that are created from the chemicals that are released during this event. And the people that hit those NO2, I mean, the people that hit that nitrous oxide cloud, uh, tend to start looking like this and laughing uncontrollably and stuff. So... I mean, if you think that's a big laugh, look, it gets even bigger. Like she, she just, she just can't control herself. Right. And that's associated with that witch lady as well. So the kid is like, forget that we can get out of here. Now, if you notice these kids look like they've been slimed by a ghost. Remember we covered Ghostbusters and we talked about the slime and the slime represented that ooze and that sort of, um, viscous byproduct of the plasma itself of ectoplasm and it leaves behind this sort of watery wet you know stuff i don't know if it's sticky or not so i don't want to say sticky but it leaves behind this residue and the kids are covered in that which which suggests to me that they're around a strong electromagnetic presence so this phantasoid deal which is all super albino white looking jumps at them starts to try to attack it rips up all of his stories this thing's called the shredder and the shredder rips up this kid's stories that he spent forever writing and he's like i can't write i've got writer's block right i was just uh jumping in the chat real quick he says i used to love writing scary stories i used to love that (sighs) There's a way out of this place. He's just focused on getting out. He's like, we got to get out of here. See, the thing though is, it's not time for him to get out of here yet. This kid is here for for a learning purpose. He's here to grow. As maybe we are too, right? This kid's here. He's so focused on getting out. It's like, kid, you got to take it one step at a time. Learn your purpose for being here. Accomplish your purpose for being here. Then you can go if you'd like to, right? So he's like, there's a way out of this place. That girl that wrote the diary, she did it and she escaped. I've been piecing together her notes and there's bits here and there. She hid them throughout the books. So in case Natasha found out, the witch, that she wouldn't know the full plan. So let me break that down again, but simply, right? Simply put, this this mystery kid that allegedly escaped this house 
left all of these little clues in the form of a personal diary, but embedded them in different books all throughout this world library type thing, right? What does that mean to us if this house represents the world? That means that there are little clues hidden in different stories all throughout our world. <laughs> Each one has a little piece. Each one has a little breadcrumb. And somebody left those for us to follow. So they go back to the old stories. Once again, they go back to the old ways and the old stories. Grimm's Fairy Tales. Hey, Leonardo Gonzalez. That was kind. He just donated 20 bucks. He says, here's a little something for you to keep motivated. Thanks for the good content. Well, that is motivating. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're a cool dude, Leonardo. And my favorite, Ninja Turtle. Just kidding. He probably gets that all the time. <laughs> um, so Yasmin, the girl, says that's totally unrealistic. She's talking about Hansel and Gretel, right? That's totally unrealistic. Remember, she's just regurgitating what the, what the other witch has already said. That's the witch's attitude, right? Thanks again, Leonardo. So the girl says that's totally unrealistic. No one would just eat candy off of a stranger's house. Really? Or you wouldn't do that. You don't prefer to do that. See, I feel like there's so many errors in our thinking as a society worldwide. One of those is that we, we project onto the world our own personal opinions and feelings and preferences. Nobody would do that. That's what I call an absolute statement. The Sith deal in absolutes. We don't deal in absolutes. We're open-minded, right? So this kid says, you don't think I'm weird? Because he's starting to share his like interest in the stories and stuff. So he's really worried about what her opinion of him is because he's insecure, right? He's, a, he's, he's, he's afraid of, of himself. That's the worst thing to be afraid of. That's the scariest thing you can be afraid of is yourself. That's the thing that hits home, right? And she says, but you are weird. But the thing that makes you weird makes them ordinary. And nobody likes to be ordinary. Ordinary sucks. I would say that that right there is the crux of this movie. She's been telling him, everyone has been sort of suggesting to this kid, Alex, the defender of mankind, trying to get him to realize who he is, to accept who he is, to bask in who he is, right? To be excited about it. And to claim his own identity instead of shunning away from his self and who he is and what he's good at and what he enjoys, right? Ordinary sucks. And that's why I do this channel, okay? I don't do this channel for ordinary people. I don't make videos for ordinary people and regular people and lemmings and robots and zombies and Walmartians and whatever. No, man, I'm making this video for the select few, for the small amount of us that can see past and see through the stories and find the breadcrumbs and find our way back home. I'm talking to people who resonate, right? Great minds think alike. So I'm talking to those like-minded people. And there's a few of us out there. And I believe that movies like this, stories, they speak to us on such an intimate level if we would only allow them to for just a moment. If we could step outside of the glaze of our eyes of just being simply amused and without thought, for a couple of hours and we can actually consider these little messages, these little Easter eggs of life that are dropped to us from time to time might help us out. So ordinary people are going to try and take that away from you. All of the ordinary people don't want you to be extraordinary. It makes them feel weird. <laughs> like, well, I don't, you need to be ordinary like us. Come join us. Don't be different out there, right? They have a very us versus them kind of mentality. They want to assimilate. They want to get everybody to be cookie cutter versions of themselves. Now it's story time again. Another night comes and they decide that they're going to write a special story to try to trick the witch right? Because when they were up there researching, they found a spell to um, like a sleeping potion, right? And they're like, wow, there's a sleeping potion spell. So we'll use it on the witch. However, we're missing one ingredient. We don't know what, what that ingredient is. 
but the kid's like, I bet the witch knows. So I'm going to make up a story. And she, since she's so fond of correcting me all the time, I'm going to purposefully make the wrong ingredient, the, the, the actual missing ingredient that we need. That way she'll correct me and she'll just give me the ingredient that we need to put her to sleep. Yes, that is what I'm talking about. That's clever. And that's how a lot of heroes of times past get past the evils um, of history, right? Um, they get past the evils by outwitting them. You don't have to be the strongest, the fastest, the quickest, the most prepared, the most this, the most that. All you have to do is use your wits. Keep your wits about you. That seems to be one of the themes that I picked up on. So she asks him again. She interrupts him. She's like, well, wait a minute. I don't, wait a minute. Forget that story for a second. Why do you want to burn your night books? Now, that's the name of the movie. The night books are the books that he writes at nighttime, right? When all the rest of the world is sleeping, he stays up and he wonders about what could be and possibilities and um, connections and all, all kinds of things. He allows his mind to wonder. He's creative and insightful and imaginative when everybody else is asleep. He writes his night books. He writes his stories. He exercises that portion of his brain that the day walkers try to suppress, that they try to keep hidden away. So she's, she wants to know the story. Why do you want to burn your night books, right? She brings it up again. Uh, for, so he's telling the story. He's telling a new story. For generations, the evil sorcerer of Quantel sent children to mine jewels from the mouth of the great monster. Now... There's some truth to that as well, because legend has it that the entrance into the inner earth, uh, earth or the cave entrance or whatever you want to call it, the cave of wonders, cave of saviors, whatever you, whatever you like to call it, is full of jewels, precious jewels all over the place. Um, so that resonates with me as well. So these kids are sent to mine jewels from the mouth of the great monster. The evil sorcerer had a chance to kill the odious beast, but instead he used a powerful potion to keep the monster unconscious. Time out. Wait a minute. They're talking about this powerful monster. It just happens to be like a tentacle monster, as you can see, with the big mouth open that's going to devour stuff. That's Kronos. That's all kinds of symbolism. It kind of looks like Krang from the Ninja Turtles, <clears throat> speaking of Leonardo. So this is like the eye in the sky. This is Kronos that sucks up everything during the depressurization and zero gravity event and then uh, throws it up or spits it back to the ground you know once that's all done and the polarity is reversed but instead he uses a powerful potion to keep the monster monster unconscious so keeping this monster asleep the sleeping monster of old like cthulhu or so many other monsters i can't think of them off the top of my head right now because i'm on the spot but uh, there's lots of different um, bad guys and monsters, especially cosmic monsters that have this sort of period of rest where they sleep and then a period where they wake up and cause havoc for a short time and then they go back to sleep. Or even the blue beam itself is seen as retracting back into the world and falling asleep and then it has to be awakened, etc. It's a common theme. So... Uh, and the beast remained unconscious. So this wizard guy in his story pours it into the beast's ear, pours this little sleeping potion in there. But the most important ingredient was bindweed. So he makes up this stuff called bindweed. Well, he doesn't make it up. It's actual stuff, but it's the wrong ingredient. He reluctantly raises his mighty staff to kill the beast. Now time out. That's actually how the beast is killed. By a mighty staff. The blue beam shoots up. It is the staff of the gods. It's, uh, I mean, it, it's one version. It's the, it's the quintessential cosmic staff. I guess you could call it that, right? This blue beam that shoots up. When the blue beam goes up, that means the energy has fully reversed, which means that the red plasma entering into our world will dissipate. It'll be cut off like fingers just falling down, fingers of God falling down or Satan or whatever you want to refer to it as. Um, and it's seen as that blue beam is like a sword or a staff or something that destroys the onslaught of uh, serpent plasma from above. The evil sorcerer had sent her baby brother into the cave. Okay, so this is kind of like Aladdin, right? Whenever... Um, what was his name? Jafar, right? Jafar sends Aladdin into the cave of wonders or whatever to go get the magic lamp or whatever. And there's all these 
you know, precious jewels and stuff all over the place. And he's like, don't touch anything. <laughs> um, so this evil sorcerer sends this kid into the cave as well to go get, obviously, some crystals or something of value. So he tells another story, the cuckoo clock. Because the, the witch actually ends up giving him the ingredient to make the sleeping potion. Okay, so they make the sleeping potion. Then he tells another story called the cuckoo clock. And the witch passes out because <laughs> they gave her, they gave, they actually put the sleeping potion in that little spritzer that she had. And she, when she went to suck up all that blue misty stuff, she just passed right out, right? She's actually about to kill them and she passes out. Now take a look at this witch, by the way, doesn't she have a strange style of dress? One, she has totally pointy fingernails, which to me indicate like a longer lifespan and maybe like a sort of reptilian look. I don't like the word reptilian. Um, but it's associated with the gods and angels and demons and stuff like that to have claws or longer fingernails um, or longer fingers as well, actually, especially longer thumbs. I will also throw that out there. Uh, but look at that. She's sort of wearing this multicolored. Uh, I forgot what that's called, but it's like one of those fabrics that changes kind of rainbowy depending on the light and stuff like that. That is is the type of shimmer or shine that the ancient ones who came down, the watchers are said to have had. Lenore put our potion in the bottle of mist. So the cat actually helped them out this time. And cats tend to do that. They tend to be wards themselves to ward off evil presences, uh, presence and stuff like that. Um, cats are also highly esoteric in Egypt. They used to bury their dead with their cats. The cat, if the, if the owner died, the cat, psh, man, the cat's, it's, that's it. The cat's dead. They're going to bury that cat with the owner. All right. So they actually, the girl gets a bottle of his potion or whatever, spritz it on herself. And then she's able to open up or to see where the door is and open up the door. So they open up this doorway in the apartment and it leads to like this foresty outside looking area. And they're like, yes, we're free. We're going to escape. So they go out into the outside area and she starts noticing these little plants that are glowing and stuff, just like the plants that the witch owned inside of the house. And she starts looking, she tears apart a tree and on the inside of the tree was wallpaper. And then all of a sudden it dawns on them. We're still in the house. We actually haven't left, which is really interesting too. That's right, Denzel. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So they said the door, it wasn't the way out. So sometimes the way you think is the way out actually isn't the way out. Sometimes what looks like the way out could trap you and keep you inside even longer, right? It could be, a, um, it could be like a, a false door. And I do believe that our world has what appear to be false exits, right? To see people going in and out of them quite often. All right. So as you can see, there's also this sort of eye in the sky, kind of plasma light, sort of rainbow. Then you hear hooves pounding. This is what I call plasma vision. I just made that up. But to me, plasma vision is what the plasma sees, what the spirit sees. It sees into what we would call the spirit world or the spirit realm, the electromagnetic energetic realm or vibratory realm. And it sees altogether different. It doesn't need the light that we need in order to bounce stuff off of our eyes and stuff. It picks up on aura. It picks up on heat signatures and other things like that. So something's coming towards them. Boom. It's the unicorn. It's actually called the evil unicorn in this story. <laughs> now, remember, this is the unicorn that the girl had chased in order to get locked into um, this this evil house or whatever, right? Now, let's talk about the unicorn. Uni means one, like unicycle, one wheel, right? Um, unicorn means one horn. It's really weird that it's not called a unihorn, but the word horn used to be pronounced with a ch sound so unicorn and it turned into corn because we cowboy we have like a cowboy language language where we change it um at least here in america so you see the unicorn's horn lighting up this sort of plasma colors and it starts to chase them right they're like evil unicorn ah run so the horned beings the ones with one horn or whatever right um those beings who came down into our world known as the watchers are said to have horns, that they actually grow horns as well. Um, and that could be related on one note. I also believe that if we were able to live a lot longer, we might actually grow horns as well. 
I think that we're just sort of in a constant state of eternal prepubescence uh, in comparison to the immortals, okay? We have our period of puberty that we go through or whatever, but it's it's like right after we're born, comparatively speaking. Um, so yeah, I think that we can grow horns as well if we lived to if we lived long enough depending on the situation but then there's also the one horn the one horn that shoots up out of the ground the one spike the one beam the one wherever you want to call it and that would be the blue beam so they get chased by this unicorn they end up guess what at a gingerbread house exactly like in Hansel and, Gre- uh, Hansel and Gretel right and the girl's like whoa no way and he says every good story hints at truth He repeats that again in this movie. Every good story hints at truth. I think there's truth to everything. People are like, what do you believe in? I'm like, if I have to have a choice, I'm not going to pick something. I believe in everything. (laughs) Like, I love all of it. I think it's all great. It's all real. There's There's little breadcrumbs of truth in everything. It's all made out of the truth. It's just tied up in little knots that we call lies. But is it? Is it? Is it anything? Can anything truly just be complete fabrication or does it all have to come from somewhere? That's the question. All right. So he says Hansel and Gretel was real. Like this just dawns on him. He's, he's literally looking at it right now. He's like, wow, this story, that's just a old wives tale, bedtime story, legend, whatever is actually real. Now, was there a house made out of gingerbread and stuff like that? I don't know, but there are elements of truth to the stories could be. Let's check this out. Now the girl gets hypnotized. She just loses her mind. She's the same one that just started saying, that's that's not real. Nobody would ever just eat a house or eat pieces off of somebody's house. That's ridiculous. Remember, she was the naysayer. Now she's under some sort of a hypnotic spell. And all of a sudden, following her, news, her nose like Toucan Sam down to uh, the little cottage made out of candy. You see that hypocrisy there? People always do that. They do stuff like that. Just like they totally deny stuff. <laughs> and then it happens to them and they get they get plasma possessed or whatever. All right, so they go down into the gingerbread house. She starts picking pieces of it. She eats it. She gets totally plasma possessed. And then this time, instead of like light coming from the eyes, they made the eyes look like candy, which I really like too. What do you guys think the symbolism of the eyes turning into pieces of candy would be? So the thing is, the kid, Alex... He's like, what are you doing? Like, I don't think that's a good idea. Then she offers him a piece of candy from the house. And then he just, he he starts to fall under the spell too. And he takes a bite. Does this sound familiar? Boy and girl in a forest together, forbidden to eat eat something. The girl shares it with the boy and all of a sudden they're screwed. (laughs) Like the whole world's falling apart. Yes. Sounds very familiar. Adam and Eve, right? Uh, then this is a hard picture to see, but up here is the top of some sort of a hallway and the hallway walls are made out of this gelatinous sort of jelly looking thing. It's like a jelly hallway. It's interesting to me because jelly is also one of the symbols of plasma. Plasma is symbolized by jelly often, um, in my research that I've come across. Now he goes down into this room after he goes through this little jelly hallway And in this room, you can see another subliminal all-seeing eye in the sky right there in the middle on the top where it should be with one circle and then another circle and little rays coming out of it and stuff. And right underneath that, there's this weird coffin being fed this bluish white plasma looking stuff going into it. So let's check it out. So they zoom in on it. They show you. Now check this out. This blue stuff that's being fed into this coffin or I'm sorry, being taken out of the coffin. Um, also it has like these little stripes on it. So this looks like a candy cane, right? Or a barbershop pole or just a pole, how people used to make poles to signify the North pole or the South pole. I don't know if there is a South pole, but, um, the North pole is definitely a red and white striped candy cane looking pole, right? Um, and that's what this is. So could that be giving us a direction? Possibly. So she reaches down with her little rainbow colored arm, grabs these little bottles of vial, these vials that are being filled with the blue mist. She takes it up and she sprays herself. That's where she gets her power. She gets her power from the real witch. Okay. So check this out. This is where there's a twist in the story. This is actually the, the witch from Hansel and Gretel. 
But the young, beautiful witch was one of the girls that escaped from the Hansel and Gretel witch, figured out how to put her asleep and kept her asleep and then just used her power to extend her own life and to, you know, get her power as a witch or whatever. Right. So then the young witch busts out this little like blue plasma thing where she's showing them stuff that has happened in the past. She's explaining how she used to be a kid that was captured by the Hansel and Gretel witch and she figured out how to make a sleeping potion. Turns out she's the one that left all of those little diary notes scattered across all of the books trying to teach the kids how to escape or at least sharing her escape plan, right? Well, it turns out that she escaped, but whenever she left, her parents were no longer there, right? Like she just went right back to her house and nobody was there. So she felt like she didn't have anywhere else to go. So she came back to the uh, gingerbread house and then she stole this witch's power while she was sleeping, kept her in this coffin and then kept her asleep while stealing her power. So she used to clean the oven of the witch and the kids like, you're the unicorn girl. Wow. Mindbender, you're the unicorn girl. She's like, oh, you read my diaries. Okay. And then she busts out her little unicorn pendant or whatever. And uh, she says, if she does not get a story, we're all going to die. So the house starts to shake and stuff. This witch right here needs a story every single night. And it has to be a scary one, right? It has to be a scary story. Cannot have a happy ending. Why? Because it has to keep that asleep. In order to keep that asleep, it needs to be fed all of this vileness and and fear and uh, people being scared and stuff that doesn't have a good a good ending, a happy ending. That's our world today. That's the blue beam that needs to return to our world to introduce magic, right? It stays asleep the more we concentrate on uh, the negativity that we have in our world. But once we start to return to change the balance, to change the energetic balance in our world to positivity, that's whenever we start to influence the polarity of our own world and bring about a change. So it needs to have some sort of a messed up story to keep that hidden down inside the earth. If, if it represents the blue beam, we'll say, right? And some people who are already in charge of this world, like this younger witch, she wants to keep that suppressed. She wants to keep that hidden away. Why? Because that event right there is the ultimate leveler. It's the ultimate thing that makes us all on an even playing field. Okay. The apocalypse, the apocalypse will reset everything so that there are no laws. There are no police and governors and presidents and Kings and Queens. You are now completely free and in charge of your own life. The people who are in charge of you now, they don't want that. They'd like to keep their power. So they try to keep that blue beam asleep. She says stories, keep her asleep. Stories of fear and suffering and death are like sweet lullabies to her right? ba ba bum the birthday party. So now she's like, you have to read her a story because that old Hansel and Gretel witch, which, which is super powerful, is about to wake up and clean house, literally, right? So she's like, tell a story, tell a story. And the kid's like, all right. I mean, the only story I can tell is my own. And she, she actually wants him to tell his story of why he was going to burn all of his night books. So he finally gives us the answer. Why was he so upset at his birthday party? Remember at the beginning of the movie, he just stormed out of his own birthday party and it was all, it was all like haunted house themed and stuff, Halloween themed and stuff like that. So we're going to get into the backstory. Uh, there once was a boy who loved to write scary stories. They just didn't get his fascination with creepy things. He's talking about his friends, right? So all of his friends, they didn't get it. They didn't understand it. They just started calling him names and thinking that he was a weirdo and stuff. To them, he was just weird, right? <sighs> What's wrong with you? They would ask. This kid's talking about himself right now. This is a true story, right? The best stories have the most truth to them. So he's telling his own story. That's all we can really do is tell our own story. So all of these kids are picking on this kid, man. And I'm, I'm going to tell you guys 100%. I'm kind of getting choked up a little bit right now thinking about it. This 
part made me cry. Okay. It's super sad. Oh man. It's heartbreaking. So to them, this kid was just weird, right? What's wrong with you? They'd ask. Now it goes into a flashback. This is his best friend, Josh, right? Says Josh was my best friend. And Alex finishes his latest bone chilling tale. So he's writing a new story or whatever. And he's like, hey, hey, you're going to love this one, man. Check this out. I'm writing this new scary story, etc." And he's like, do you want to come to my birthday party tonight? It's going to be a haunted house and everything. And, and this kid, Joshua, who's like one of these cool kids is like, man, eh, some other kids having like a, a video game party tonight, man. He's like, but my birthday's tonight. We turn the whole apartment into like a haunted house. It's going to be great. And the kid's like, well, I mean, Cody's having a gaming party, but you're my best friend. I mean, look at you, the way you dress, the things you like, all you do is talk about scary stories. Everyone thinks it's weird. Boo this kid, boo that kid and boo all the kids in the world and boo all the, boo all the people in the world that do that following in line, trying to be cool, trying to be trendy, trying to show up and just do what everyone else is doing and ditching the spirit field, the spirit filled people and individuals who are different, who add the flavor and the salt of life to this bland world and their bland experiences. Boo that kid. Uh, it's interesting to me. This kid's name is Joshua. There's maybe some implication there. So Joshua doesn't show up to this kid's birthday party, right? He had his whole apartment turned into the haunted house that he had just written about. Nobody showed up. Not one, not one person, not one friend, not one kid. And he was heartbroken. And that's why he got so upset. Not even Josh, not even his best friend showed up. They made him hate the thing that he loved the most. They made this kid hate his very identity. And they made him hate himself. It's kids crying. That's so messed up because that's the world that we live in, man. All of those normal, regular, average people... They're, they can be very, they're like bullies sometimes. I mean, not everybody, but you've all gone through it. I go through it, you know, from time to time. We get stronger as we go, but man, I can relate. God, I can relate to that kid getting picked on. Nobody's interested in the cool stuff that he's interested in. You know, his mind's super creative and they just all want to do regular stuff and talk about the weather and stuff. And he wants to talk about werewolves and vampires and the apocalypse and crazy stuff and Night of the Living Dead. And he invites everybody to come hang out. He just wants a friend, man. That's all he wants. He just wants a friend. Nobody wants to be his friend. And the only place that he found one, interestingly enough, was in this place that he just got trapped in. So he's, he's sad, man. He's brokenhearted. Nobody shows up to his birthday party. Nobody has his back. He, it's, it's like, you know, he, he's so lonely. And that's us. That's us, man. We get lonely. We get just like this kid. I know many of you have out there. Right? You feel like you're the only one that's thinking outside the box or you're the only one that's you know, waking up to new and improved ideas on life and philosophy and cosmology and science and academics and um, you're seeing the world with a brand new pair of eyes, but everybody else is still in the dark, walking around with their eyes closed. And all you want is to just have friends. All you want is to fellowship. All you want to do is just hang out with some people and laugh and have a good time and high five and get excited about the things that excite you. I can relate to that. The real truth is, he says, he was, he was embarrassed to be himself. He was embarrassed to be himself. And he got mad and he screamed and he tore up his room and he's like, I hate all this stuff. And I'm going to tell you what, I actually have felt like that many times just in the last couple of years. There's been many times that I'm like, forget YouTube, forget writing books, forget trying to share my stuff with all these people. Gah! <laughs> I've lost it a few times myself. 
so I can relate. I feel so bad for this kid, man. But I love this kid. Let me tell you why. Because it does not end it there. He makes it a happy ending. He swore he'd never write another story again. Um, because he wanted to be like Josh and his friends. And then he wouldn't have to be alone. It's just lonely sometimes, right? I get that. And then a witch captured him. Ah, at the loneliest, at the part where you feel like you're the most broken, crazy stuff happens in your life. And it seems like it just couldn't get any worse. And boom, it gets worse. A witch captures him. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me. The best thing that ever happened to me, he says, because I made new friends. Friends who love me for who I am, not for who they want me to be. And she's like, what? Oh my God. Because the, the Hansel and Gretel witch starts to wake up because she's like, what the happy ending? No, 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 no. Right? Because that's what wakes her up. Right? Hearing about the good news and the happy ending and stuff is what releases this magical creature into the world or whatever. There's the, uh, there's the all seeing eye up there, the eye, eye in the sky. Uh, she's like, what have you done? No. So the Hansel and Gretel witch is starting to like knock on the coffin and break it open and stuff. And he's like, this is our happy ending. Now, guess what? This is sort of an apocalyptic event within the house, we'll say, on a macro, microscopic scale, a smaller scale. Uh, he's like, this is our happy ending, right? The bad things, the trials and tribulations in life are those fires that refine us and make us better. You see, we, we have a problem and a tendency that we don't look far enough down the road. We only just see the speed bump that we just hit, right? But just around the bend is good news. Just around the bend is a happy ending. Just around the bend, just on the other side, is the thing that you've been waiting for to make it all make sense. So hang in there. Uh, and then everything starts to turn blue. So we had all the red symbolism. Now we've got the blue symbolism as this other witch, sort of representing the blue beam and magic and stuff, uh, starts to wake up essentially. So we see blue everywhere and the bones start cracking. <laughs> she moves like the chick from the ring and it's scary. Okay. There's actually parts of this movie that are scared me. <laughs> like, ah, especially cause I was watching some of them on like super fast speed and she's like, ah, or whatever like that it creeped me out. So boom, hand sticks up. She's coming back to life. Don't know what that is. Let's skip that. Oh, there's the witch. Okay, so it's kind of dark, but you can see the witch. She looks at the younger witch. She's like, you did this to me. She says, I have lived in fear of you for so long, but I am not that little girl anymore. Booyah! Busts out some blue magic plasma power. And guess what the kid says? Witch fight! Oh my God, it's the witch fight, <laughs> which is super cool. It kind of reminds me of the wizard's duel in uh the sword and the stone but anyhow so they take off while the two witches are fighting each other they try to escape the house they just want to get out of there so she stole one of those perfume things spritzes herself she gets the witch's power for momentarily and she's able to open up the actual door the alternative door the real door that lets them leave so this portal opens up where it should they get onto the elevator that that was stuck in the beginning they're clearly slimed and everything right uh, the witch follows them. This part creeped me out. <laughs> the witch follows them. She's reaching down from this hole in their miniature sky or the roof or whatever you want to call it. And she's trying to get them, right? The witch is screaming. The cat actually helps out. The cat attacks. It's totally protective. The, uh, the cat acts as their sort of guardian. Um, and he did save the cat's life earlier too. So the cat's kind of paying him back. And... He says stories about fear and death are like lullabies to her. So wait a minute. He's like, he starts to pretend like he's reading stories from the book. And she's like, yes, yes, read it, read it. Tell me more, tell me more what happens. And then he throws the book into the furnace, right? And she jumps into the furnace to try to grab the book so it doesn't burn away. And they shut the door on the witch, just like in Hansel and Gretel. They're slimed but they're alive. They're happy. They made it past this sort of mini apocalypse of their own. And they made a new friend. They made a friend in each other and they made a friend of this weird little alien invisible cat creature as well. 
Uh, then it, it zooms in and it says the end on one of his little burnt up pieces. Isn't that great? Wasn't that a good movie? The end. Or was it? Bum, bum, bum. Oh, well, we actually have more scenes. We go back to his room, right? He goes back home. He's back in his room. I just want to show you his room real quick. Check out how much cool stuff this kid has. And it's all plasma apocalypse related, okay? He's got Freddy Krueger over here, which are the fingers of God that come down and put people to sleep and all that stuff. Then we got Candyman, which I might do a video on in the future, so I don't want to go too much into detail about Candyman, but that also has the sacred bees and the honey and stuff like that. Uh, he's got the hands. Remember in Ghostbusters, that one lady had like a, a statue of just a hand in her apartment. D- Dana Barrett in her apartment had that hand statue. He also has a statue of just a hand. There's, there's a hand right there. Interesting. The little finger symbolism, right? Also, there's the mirror symbolism as well, but we won't get into that right now. He puts up these movie posters. He's all about this. So this one's the people under the stairs. This one over here, some people might recognize um dang what's that movie called that just had a brain fart uh they live yes so that's from they live right here people under the stairs right there and then he's got this clipping of his friend that he made in that house she was a missing kid right so we talked about the missing kid theory as well and let's see he's got Candyman. he's got freddy krueger he's got some hand symbolism then he's pops a squat right next to his bed, but his bed puts him right next to his blankets, which have these little, uh, gravestones on them. So symbolically he's alive in the place of the dead, right? Sometimes we feel like that. Sometimes we feel like we're the only ones who are actually alive. And there's a bunch of zombies walking around all dead, right? Uh, so his friend comes in, she's like, you could use this. She gives him a brand new, fresh, book to start writing new stories in now check this out when we wake up okay whatever degree of waking up you're at or whatever you would like to call it the cool thing is you get to write your own story especially after the plasma apocalypse you get to write any life lead any kind of life you want after that reset you're free to choose your own adventure Now, it's also similar whenever you start to wake up, you start to change mentally and you change your perspective on the current world that you live in already. You start to see everything with brand new eyes and you live a little bit differently. So she gives him this little uh, notebook to write in, to write new stories and stuff. And she says, stay weird, storyteller. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that a happy ending? Or is it? Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, it was. That was totally the ending. (laughs) Well, that was the movie, Night Books. It's on Netflix. It's a great one to watch, you know, with the family. If you want to watch something that's kind of scary, I think it's like PG-13 or something. Um, I didn't find too many, like, inappropriate things in it. There was one scene where the cat was invisible and goes potty on this kid's sandwich. It was really gross. I don't know why they needed to even have that in the movie, but it was nasty. I didn't want to show it. Um, but other than that, the whole movie was actually really good. And I love the moral. I love the moral to this story. I love that they tell you so much that all this truth is ingrained within our fantasy and our fiction and our stories and stuff like that. I loved it. I had a great time watching this movie, breaking it down with all of you guys. I'm going to go ahead and go roll the credits now until next time. I'm Jay Dreamer saying good vibes and goodbye. I'm trying so-